Well, Robert Burns wrote, the best laid schemes of mice and men, gang after glay and leave us naught but grief and pain for promised joy. I said that because I'm going to try to be kind of quick tonight. I might pull a Howard. I told him this morning. But uh, you'll say if I extend my lesson a little too long, well, there he goes again. Well, I don't care. I'd rather you say there he goes again than there he lies, you know. But nevertheless, I'll do the best I can. There's lots of cram into this. In the book of Acts and in the epistles, we see an organization of the church. We also see the teaching of the church, the morals, and the work of the church. But there's an evil one. Be sober, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom will stand steadfastly in your faith. So there's an evil one, but that's not all. <clears throat> he uses what I like to call henchmen, or you could call minions or something, and there are armies of them. Our wrestling is not against flesh and blood, but against the powers, against the, uh, the uh, world rulers of this darkness, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly, our heavenly places. And so Ephesians 6, 12 lets us know that we're really up against it. Christianity is a fight. I don't understand everything about why. Some of it I do. God wants those who are best equipped in a love for truth and goodness and light to be with him in heaven. And so it involves the way he designed it, this type of thing. I believe the main three forces that the evil one uses against us are found in the book of Revelation in symbolic form and throughout the Bible. One of them we see in uh, Revelation 13, a beast comes up out of the sea. Sea oftentimes in the Old Testament churning and waving represents nations or peoples and this beast comes up and it has actually ten diadems upon its heads, seven heads. Diadema is the royal crown so we would think of something like royal power, he wears out the saints, I just think of persecution. And then another one comes up out of the ground where the devil tried to conquer the woman, the church, and spewed out of his mouth, which we would think something coming out of his mouth is a lie. And the ground helped her and swallowed up the, the, the flood. But this beast comes up out of where the flood went. He has horns like a lamb, and yet he speaks like a dragon. Later on, he's called the false prophet, Revelation 19, verse 20. And then we have in, later on in Revelation 17, the great harlot, and she has the cup of abominations and full of it adulteries and all representing immorality. So you might say the big three, if you want to go to heaven, if you want your children to and your grandchildren, watch out for them being driven away by persecution. We don't help them when we teach them weakness in the Lord's church and that everything else comes first. They've got to be strong. And after that, false teaching. Though some don't like that for some reason, I, I think I know some of the reasons. There's more than one. But they don't like to hear about false teaching. HD's right on that. Uh, I can say that because I've gone through the same experiences that he has. <clears throat> and then the other one's immorality. If ever we need to watch out for something and to get our children, it's this great minion of Satan. So man fell in every way possible. The Spirit saith expressly that in later times some shall fall away from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. And then it says they're branded in their own consciences with a hot iron forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God created to be received with thanksgiving by them that believe and know the truth. So there's part of it, Gnosticism in this don't eat this, don't eat that. Of course, Judaism had that in it also. So one of the first things we see, I think, I noticed in the Bible about false doctrine, one of the first false teachings was about the nature of Christ. There are many deceivers gone forth into the world, even they that confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Well, what does that have to do with anything? In other words, God the Son did not die on the cross. He seemed to be an apparition or something maybe, but 
flesh is evil, so that little philosophy mixed in began to attack the deity of Christ in flesh, the incarnation. And as we read church history in the first century, those that knew the apostles and right after, the next thing we notice is the attack was on the organization of the church. There was a monarchal bishop, and they decided it would help things. All these false doctrines come from men thinking, usually with their conscience seared, and a lack of knowledge to look to the Bible. They begin to think, well, this would be good. We'll have a monarchal bishop. Everyone obey him. And uh, he maybe knew the apostles, maybe not, but follow him and the rest are elders underneath him. Well, that was the first thing. Now, let's make a little bit of a leap forward to our day and earlier. When men here in this country wanted just the plain scriptures, just wanted the Bible to find New Testament Christianity, one might say, well, why are you so, so concerned over instrumental music and the missionary society? It seems so trivial and like one eldership that was connected with James O'Kelly, I believe, in Vermont that I went to talk with, and some of our members. And they were with the Christian Connection. They went off for a while with uh, Reformed churches, but got back with their original, original tradition and showed them I, they couldn't answer why instrumental music was incorrect in that it was not according to God's will. And this one elder seeming to be one of the leaders, an elder, one of the leaders, and said, yeah, well, if that's all we're doing wrong, I expect we'll still have the gates of heaven open to us, something along that line. The way to answer this type of thinking is, uh, it's a wrong type of thinking. I hope we don't have it ever. I understand if you get two lines, I, I don't know much about geometry, but if you get two lines uh, seemingly parallel, but there's a little bit of an angle, tiny little bit of an angle, and they begin to go outward, eventually that angle becomes so wide that you've got a miles between them. And so what does that mean doctrinally? Well, we'll end up with two popes canonized at the same time. The Bible says nothing about a papa, a pope. The Bible says nothing about the Roman Catholic view of saints, uh, canonized and men of great stature spiritually. All the Bible says is that if you're a Christian, you're a saint. You're set apart for God's use. Nevertheless, that's where you end. There's no stopping. If we don't have it right with the little things, there's no stopping this side of Roman Catholicism. Nevertheless, these small departures begin to lead to one thing after another. Because people thought, I think it'd be nice, I think it would be good, I think it would be helpful. Well, if we, we see that go on in that thinking and doctrine and organization, we got the monarchal bishop, as I mentioned, synods, cardinals, the pope, councils, monasticism, various types of creeds that were all designed to fight false doctrine. And then, every time there's a little split, there's another creed made to defend you know, denominationalism and orders like the Benedictines and catechisms and physical priesthood and confession to priest and then there were councils and there was holy days like Easter and a liturgy to follow and in doctrine what did we get? Well we got Mariality or a Mariality, a worship of Mary, the assumption of Mary, scripture versus tradition and they chose the tradition over the scripture Sacraments, predestination, images, icons, Arianism, bulls or orders from the Pope. Sign of the cross with all its superstition, the infant baptism, worshiping of angels, and prayer to saints, Manichaeism, original sin, Passion Week, Mass, festivals, processions. Now in the parable of the wicked steward, which I wish we had time, but we can't go into it tonight. But Jesus made a statement that stands in context, but also out of context, out of that immediate context. He that is a, a righteous in very little is righteous also in much. And he that is unrighteous in very little is unrighteous also in very much. Little things count. Little beginnings should not be despised. And a study of the Bible in minor things is extremely important if I understand the Bible and if I read church history correctly. 
They become little wedge things and false teachers split over them. Eventually, it got so bad that the Catholic Church could not stand itself. And you had the West and the East, and sometimes you'd have a Pope in each one or the Great Shepherd. And so the Greek Orthodox split off of the Roman Catholic Church 1054 A.D., long before. If you'll bear with me with no malice in my heart as far as I know, God show me if I have it. But that was long before denominationalism like Methodism, Quakers, Baptist Church, the Lutheran Church. Long 500 years before all of that, you had the split in 1054. Then you got, Rome, you got the denominationalism in the 1500s. And at the time of our Revolutionary War, it's a very interesting time for us, even church-wise. You have the Anglicans, the Church of England, but they didn't have a lot of sway at that time because they served the king, you know. They were all mostly Tories and not well welcomed in this country. But then you had the Quakers, and in Pennsylvania, as a matter of fact, you read things that are kind of interesting. The Quakers charge shipmasters 100 pounds sterling because they brought Methodist preachers over here to this country. And I remember reading about John Adams all perplexed and upset. He says, right now, we have five men in jail, down at the local jail, because they didn't keep the Anglican Sabbath. And that's where this thing about separation of church and the state came. It was this little colonies, and they got in control by various denominations, and they passed laws you had to follow religiously. Then you had the Baptists that came along in the 1600s, but an interesting tale uh, about them. In 1714, the Anglicans, in a control of a, a section of North America, imprisoned five of them. And it says they went on their way singing to jail, and they had to be represented by a man by the name, he, he rode 50 miles to do it. His name was Patrick Henry. You know him that said, I know not what course others might take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Well, he came down there to defend them, and we really have a little account of what it was like. He spoke in measured terms, they say, to the whole courtroom and to the judge and the jury. What have these men done? But they spoke the word of God. And he took that little thing they were charged with, waving it around, waved it up and said, great God! There was an ultimate silence all over everywhere. They got off. They got off. But that's the way it was back then. And I don't know, and I'm not the, a prophet or the son of a prophet, but if the churches of Christ, especially our liberal brethren, had some kind of control like that, I wouldn't want to live around them. We'd be pressed and put in jail and everything else even our own brethren. So we don't want that. The Presbyterians were there many more. All of these were departures from the Bible and they began with very little things. In England, there were some who said, why can't we get away from this? We don't want to be Catholics. We don't want to be Protestants. We don't want to, don't want to be Jews. Can't we just be plain Christians? Neither this or that type of Christian. We can be a member of the Lord's church without ever joining a human denomination. They had some influence on some brethren that came to this country, as many were about that time. And they were the rich uh, Haldane brothers. They were trying to establish that over in Scotland. And also the Sandemans, about 1730s, 1750s. In our country, you've heard us speak about James O'Kelly, 1770s to 1790. Elias Smith, a Methodist, and James O'Kelly was a Methodist. He wanted, basically, a Republican form of government, but he did go into other things from the Bible. I particularly don't like his attitude in some things, but Elias Smith in the, from the Baptist, Abner, or from the Methodists, Abner Jones in 1802 from the Baptist, Barton W. Stone and uh, Thomas Campbell, Alexander Campbell from the Baptist. Now, Thomas Campbell knew a little bit about religious division because he ultimately had to become an old light Presbyterian and not just that an old light anti-burger Presbyterian and not only that an old light anti-burger uh, seceder Presbyterian 
And on top of all that, an old light, anti-burger, seceder, Presbyterian. And he, this is not right. And he began to have these views because of the Presbyterians wanting to kick him out for fellowshipping with some who were not Presbyterians. And when Tom, Alexander got to this country a year later, they both had the same views. Let's try to have New Testament Christianity. Now, they wanted to restore the church we read about in the Bible, which is exactly scriptural. The seed of the kingdom is the word of God. If I plant that same seed here in and uh, I, I don't know, I asked Ross, he didn't know what year it was either, I don't think, but it's 2014. But anyway, if we plant that seed right now, we should produce just plain Christians, not a member of this denomination or that denomination. So they assumed several things strongly. One, that the Bible is understandable. I had a preacher student that went to school with me <laughs> Uh, they're all funny. People are funny to me sometimes. I'm funny. I, mean, I can laugh about myself too, but we're talking about denominational preaching. Ogden hardly, he sold all his cattle so he could go to preacher school. That was the day when you suffered a little bit to go to preacher school. Didn't try to get rich doing it. Nevertheless, I, he said about Faulty, I can, hard, I can remember him, I can hardly shake hands with him. Well, why is that? Well, they got the same Bible I have. They can understand the Bible. Why can't they understand that they don't need to be a member of this denomination or that? Nevertheless, they assume the Bible's understandable. And Paul said, I've written unto you nothing but what you might read or... Now, it uses epignosis there, full knowledge, full knowledge that you may read. And then it has in a lot of the lexicons, i.e., or that is, understand. I've written unto you nothing but what you may read and understand. Paul said, 2 Corinthians 1.13. We don't always understand everything immediately. It takes some reading of the Bible. I think, I don't know, when I left school that sort of the technology guy in charge of teaching us all these programs said, Jerry, you've come a long way. That meant I was about where elementary school students are, I think. You've come a long way in technology, you know, and wasn't very good in my mind. Nevertheless, I didn't understand all of that immediately. I had to apply myself. I had to read the books, and I had to study the books. In logic, I've read several books. I know, like one by Toulman, four times, and I still don't understand everything in it. But I keep learning as I go through. Nevertheless, we don't all learn at the same pace either. And that's good to know because uh, we have to accept differences in each other. I can't understand something maybe, but that doesn't mean our young people can't. You know, I've heard people say, well, they can't understand the old law. We're going to skip that for our young people. Well, why in the world do we assume, and so arrogant that we assume that if I can't understand it, nobody else can? Our young people are still in school. They're still dealing with language and English and they have this all right on their forehead. All the things we've forgotten. Don't underestimate what they can understand. Had a PhD though, come from Del Mar and uh, taught at the University of A&M on the island, uh, Texas A&M on the island. Nevertheless, they told us this. When we teach a computer course, teaching teachers, you know, teaching us, he said, what we do is we tell them what we want and we step back and get out of their way. They know more about it than we do. And that's what, isn't that a, an humble way to approach some things? That just because I don't understand computers doesn't mean that it doesn't come easy for some of y'all. And you do understand them. I hate you for it, but you do understand them, uh, don't you? Uh, Paul um, has taught us the same thing. So there again, eventually these various restorers became one. They studied their Bible. They read their Bible. Boy, did they know. We got some brethren in the 1920s. You could quote any verse anywhere in that Bible. It's a big book, as you know, almost 1,000 pages. You quote one verse, they'd quote the passage, the verse right before it, and the one right after it. Why? They read their Bibles. They knew their Bibles, and they could make connections from way over here to way over there. They knew the whole Bible. And yet, 
sometimes we think, well, if I can't do it, nobody else can do it. And that's not a good attitude if you want to learn. Eventually, they became one. But men fall away, these men that wanted to return to New Testament Christianity. And we are, as I understand it, if you can believe the writings of this time by the historians, we're the only church, the only group of people, I could say, that did not outright split over the Civil War. But after the Civil War, some issues began to arise that challenged us. And they challenged the peace and unity of the church. The, you know, Paul said, keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So it's like one guy said one time I heard in a sermon, I thought it was very good because you cut down this wheat and in the olden days you take a strand or two of it and tie it and bind it. And as long as you have that bond there, it doesn't all fall apart. Keep the unity of the spirit in what? The bond of peace. I guess there are many lessons to learn in that, but we don't need shallow-minded brethren going around with all these itty-bitty nonsense things causing uproars over them. Because if they break the peace, they can break the unity. And yet there are some that just have a habit of doing that. We've often studied one of these things that helped to split the church, and that was instrumental music. And you've heard it from this pulpit a lot. And the first objection was that it kind of carnalized the worship service. God never said, make it beautiful in the ears of men or the eyes of men. That's the way the denominations in the Catholic Church thing with, think with their stained windows and their organs and all of that. But nevertheless, there was no authority for that. And we saw that through a law of exclusion that when God specifies, he excludes all other types of music and he did specify. I want to look at another one though today, briefly. And that's what we call the missionary society. Now it wasn't just the missionary society, there were all kinds of societies. Brethren thought, well, it'd be good if we have this and good if we have that. What I want to do is kind of define what it is and support that was given it and objections to it and a little bit of refutation. Mainly, if we can just remember, and you look through your Bible and prove me wrong or I'll, I'll appreciate it if I'm wrong, I don't see the church universal, the Catholic church, the church universal, organized on earth for any action at all. All you see of that, you have Christ the head and then the bodies individually here on earth that are the congregations and they're organized. There's no universal head or presidency or synod or, or pope or anything like that. It's all organized God's way. So if we can remember that, and then another thing, how did God work? We're going to see if you study your Bible, he worked through the local congregations to accomplish things. And those local congregations, if they were not under an eldership, at least the men of that congregation, if it sponsored them, the men were in charge and responsible that they did right, taught right, and kept it right. What is the missionary society? Well, first, let me give a little more background. You know, you can say a lot about history, but you've heard it all. And you know the value of even reading history with the, in view of what the Bible says. Now, first of all, Alexander Campbell wanted New Testament Christianity, as others who were already here doing that, but they didn't know them. But what they wanted was uh, just plain church, like Paul was in, and be just plain Christians. Or Campbell liked the word disciple. And they, he and Barton W. Stone debated that and all in a very good way, though. But there was a Baptist uh, organization called the Mahoning Baptist Association. They were very liberal. And they accepted the Wellsburg Baptist Church where Campbell writes on it. We didn't have anywhere to go. They had invited us to be a member of their congregation. We said, okay, as long as we can strive for New Testament Christianity. And they said, yes. And then the Wellsburg or the Mahoning Baptist Association said, yeah, we like that idea too, come. And so they were there doing that. They appointed Walter Scott, the evangelist on the Western Reserve in 1827. And they all wanted to return to the original church. Now some said, well, if we're going to do that, we're going to have to dissolve the Mahoning Baptist Association. And they did. Campbell, at least this will show you that I don't just follow him on everything, though I have benefited much from many others, but him also. 
myself. But anyway, he, he wanted some way to kind of visit and hold together and meet and cooperate together or something. But Walter Scott laid his hand on his shoulder and had him be quiet. And they voted, they agreed, and they said, we want this to dissolve and pass into the church at large, the Mahoning Baptist Association. After the vote, you know, Campbell got up and said, well, brethren, what are we going to do now? We're never going to meet again, never going to see each other again, or what? So there was a lot of meetings to discuss that, cooperation, how to do that scripturally. And we read of district meetings that were discussing a kind of a district cooperation. And out of it, out of all that, came the American Bible Association or Society. And then they'd pass out Bibles and tracts and all. And then after that came the American Christian Missionary Society. They had to have discussion on the, inst uh, on the scripturalness of these institutions eventually. Oregon was a little bit different, but they eventually, I guess you might say that made the Churches of Christ. We, the people said, no, that's not scriptural. We don't need that. We can do it the Bible way and the way they did it. So they objected to it. Support for the Missionary Society was from those like Alexander Campbell, who said, well, there's not one iota that says how we're supposed to evangelize, so we can just do it any which way we want. Uh, I know of one of the liberal members of the Church of Christ, uh, Leroy Garrett, been with him some, met him, ate with him, and all that, but he's died in the wool liberal. But his view on writing this book on Alexander Campbell, the Restoration Movement, says Campbell's attitude basically, really, if you look at all the evidence, was ambivalent. He could care less. He just wanted kind of uh, some way for brethren to get together to talk. They had, they said, all we want are annual meetings, maybe, religious edification, information across the country, what's going on, worship together, strengthen the bonds of unity, and arrange appointments for preachers of needy churches. They said, what we do not want is to organize in such a way as to legislate. We don't want to make laws and rules. We don't want to make a government in competition with the church. And Walter Scott even went along with it. For a while, some men went along with it, very good men. But they didn't want to contend for names, occasionally meet if required by brethren, as it may be proper and within proper bounds. They use language like that. But you know, it was still bothersome to a great many of the brethren. They didn't see anything like that in the Bible, in New Testament Christianity. And they said, you watch it, especially the Baptist. You watch. They're, you're going to have to comply with those suggestions or you're going to be kicked out. You're going to be branded. You're going to have to meet their request or you're going to be labeled. And you're going to have to attend to ordination of preachers, appointment of preachers, if asked. And you're going to have to supply preachers of their choice, not the congregational choice. Martin W. Stone said, well, much good can come from all of this. Alexander Campbell said, well, you can have extreme views come out of anything. Alexander saw, though, this need for a more intimate uh, relationship between brethren everywhere. And they said, well, the organized church, uh, the church in the Bible was a kingdom, so it had to have some kind of uh, organization. And I say, yes, but on what level? The way God did it was Christ as his head and the various congregations, the body, the people, the body. Mainly, though, besides experience, as the Baptist used, they were correct. It did turn to that. Orders discipline if you didn't go along with them and all of that it turned that way but in the bible there is no better uh, experience or judge than god's word and so the main argument well it doesn't matter it's prudential it's expedient do it any which way you want and that's all it was to Campbell. before i list some reasons and statements though of a lot of our brethren against a missionary society I want us to look again at the all-sufficiency of God's Word, and I just wish, and we could pray for it, do whatever we can in our day, that all the brethren we've ever known in the Lord's Church would quit this stuff about, well, I think, you know, or it seems good to me, wouldn't it be beneficial? And rather get back to where a lot of our brethren were at this time. I want a thus saith the Lord. 
I want to know what God says. But nevertheless, let's look at the all-sufficiency of the Word of God just a little bit. You've heard it before. We're trying to establish plain Christianity and be what Peter was and Paul was. We're going to use their words to guide us because they spoke from God. First of all, it says we can know the truth. Jesus said, you shall know if you abide in my word, by, abide, men know, remain in it. If you abide in my word, then are you truly my disciples and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So we can know the truth. And as I said, we can understand the Bible. It says, whereby, Paul says, whereby, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, Ephesians 3, verse 4. For we write no other thing unto you than what you read or even acknowledge. 2 Corinthians 1, 13, on the day of Pentecost, uh, Johnny Ramsey always used this one, but it's true. He said, uh, on the day of Pentecost, you have 3,000 people hear that gospel sermon. They all understood it alike and obeyed it the same way. And yet people want to say, well, you can't, it, the Bible will mean anything you want it to mean. No, not if your heart's right. Now, the truth holds that we can know the truth, we can understand Scripture, and the more we read the Bible, the more we can understand it, put things together, and we have repetition of things. Some levels of understanding take time, reading and study, reading and study. Again, Johnny Ramsey, even though he's dead now, I still have many fond memories of him, and I respected him greatly, disagreed some. That's the way life is. Nevertheless, uh, you want to know seven rules of Bible study, he'd say. Here they are, study, 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 study. <laughs> well, that's good, but even before that, something may be more important. This is why some brethren don't come on Sunday night or Wednesday night or Sunday morning Bible class. Desire and effort. Desire and effort. On any subject, we're required, though, to know Scripture. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's also profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, which is in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, furnished completely, completely unto every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. We'll live by the Word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Matthew 4, verse 4. We can go on and on almost indefinitely, but let's have just a few more. The Word of God strengthens us. And now I commend you to God through the Word of His grace, which is able to build you up or edify you, strengthen you, build you up and give you the inheritance among all them that are sanctified, Acts 20, verse 32. I have a little note here in my notes saying, go fast. But nevertheless, too often... We create things out of our own mind and they just seem good to us and we forget that God has spoken in a very complete word and very fulfilled word and it's all sufficient. Jeremiah says when you start this looking inside yourself like a lot did in his day as they fell, oh Jehovah, we know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Jeremiah 10 verse 23. And yet, so... We all think, though, and we think, and we think, and we suggest, and we suggest, and we forget. Does the Bible say something about it? There's an all-sufficiency in the Bible. Ultimately, the Word will save us. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 21, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2. Now make known unto you, brethren, the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you received, wherein also you stand, by which also you're saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached unto you. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 and 2. And it guides us through thy precepts we get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Psalm 119, 104. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalm 119, 105. The word of God even, I think, will help us to know ourselves, which is very difficult for maybe all of us, but especially for some I've known. They don't know what they do and why they do it, and they should. It may be jealousy. It may be envy. It may be pride or arrogancy. And so the Word of God is living. God's the life. The Word of God is living and active. That's the word inner gaze we get energy from. The Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, 
and quick to discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. Hebrews 4 verse 12. You have a Bible because God wants you to have a Bible. He wants His Word down through the ages. And so Isaiah says in Isaiah 55 verse 10 and 11, For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, and give a seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. It shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11. My thoughts really don't matter. It's what God says. And your desires and actions are being tested right at this moment. Your attitudes. If anything's powerful enough to save us, it would be God's word. It's not my word like fire, says Jehovah. And like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. Jeremiah 23, verse 29. So we're required to know the word because of false teachers also. Jesus said, beware of false teachers who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves by their fruits. You'll know them, Matthew 7, 15 and, and 16. For these, it says, for there shall arise, Jesus said, false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Matthew 24, verse 24. Paul said, I know that after my departing, Grievous wolves shall enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, he said to the elders at Ephesus, at Miletus, from Ephesus, from among your own selves shall men arise speaking twisted or perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Wherefore, watch ye. That'd be one of the greatest sin if I were an elder that I could commit. Not watching. Not watching. Acts 20, verse 32. So Paul said, now I beseech you, brethren, he didn't say just the elders of the preacher, I beseech you, brethren, mark them that are causing the divisions and occasions of stumbling and turn away from them. Mark means not brand, but fasten your eyes on them. Point them out. Mark them. And then again, Paul says, after he goes through 1 Corinthians and sees they're going to obey him, he said, such men as they're in the church there at Corinth, such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, fashioning themselves after apostles of Christ. And no marvel, even Satan himself fashioneth himself as an angel of light. How much more shall his ministers fashion themselves as ministers of righteousness? And then he adds something quite often added that maybe I should give a better point to adding when I have opportunity. Their end shall be according to their works. You don't want to be a false teacher. Again, 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15. Paul said, evil men and imposters shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and, and being deceived. They don't know what they're doing. 2 Timothy 3, 13. And they can lead me astray. If I don't watch, if I don't have God's help from his word, I believe Jerry Moffat can be led astray into something. Because these false prophets are identified in the book of Revelation as able even to make fire to come down out of heaven upon the earth in the sight of men. Revelation 13, verse 13. When we speak about false doctrine, you know, I, I, I can't uh, make anyone think a certain way or do anything. It's all up to ourselves and it's up to you. But I can tell you the Bible says it'll kill you. False doctrine will kill your friends and family. You know, these snake handlers, religious snake handlers, are these herpetologists, you know, I saw one the other day, he was handling a cobra, and he got ready, he threw it back in the cage to slam the door. The only thing was, he, it landed coiled and cocked, and as soon as he threw it and started to put it down, it bit him right in the stomach. So, no matter how many times the pitcher is taken to the well, eventually you're going to break it. And that happens with herpetologists. So Paul said to elders, holding to the faithful word, which is according to the teaching, that he may be able both to exhort in the sound doctrine and to convict the gainsayers. For there are many unruly men, vain talkers and deceivers, speaking, th especially they of the circumcision, speaking things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. So elders have to know the word of God. 
Now, I'm not saying you have to know it. An elder has to know it like HD, but they have to know. And uh, the elders have to study. And they shouldn't be ashamed. Of, you know, uh, when I was in, uh, teaching over in uh, CCISD, the superintendent of schools came to one of the meetings we had to go through and sat down at the table and went through all the exercises we did for some kind of a company. And it talked about what the superintendent ought to be doing and what some of them don't do. And afterward, I went to him. I said, that must have been kind of hard for you to sit there and listen to all of that. He said, it was. He said, it really was. He had to suffer through that. Elders should not be ashamed. I'm not trying to tell you what to do. I don't want anyone to come to a class of mine they don't want to come to. But elders shouldn't be ashamed to go and study in a Bible class and learn like everybody else. You don't study just to become an elder. You study to grow as an elder and help the flock. Help each other. And go to HD's classes and learn and all. Don't avoid anything like that. You, that. Knowledge is power. And in this case, it's power to do good. Power to help and do good. Nevertheless, what have we seen? Well, there's a fullness of God's word. There's a sufficiency of God's word. You can know the truth. You can understand scripture. It strengthens you. It saves you. It's all sufficient. It guides us. It leads us right into our own heart. Hebrews 4.12. And divide soul and spirit. It finds out what we're like if we'll use it correctly with a good heart. It's above our ability to accomplish anything. It's powerful. And it reveals a whole lot about false teachers. Now, if we want to know something scriptural or not, I have to skip all that. But, uh, and I don't, I mean, that's the way life is. I don't fault anybody or anything. But let me mention just a few of the objections to the American Christian Missionary Society. Here's what some of the brethren said. They're just like us, but they wrote in papers and they talked about it. I just went through some history and recorded some of their statements. There never was nor can be an occasion for any combination of churches to build up the Redeemer's kingdom. It's not in scripture. The church and the individual was the agency of God to convert the world. And that's evident to all. Another. Brethren have made agencies to do the work of the church apart from the church. And then again. Churches meeting together have turned into legislative halls. One of the things they did. You know in the Civil War. A lot of the southerners didn't fight for slavery like Robert E. Lee hated it but they fought for their country. And the North invaded my country, just like it was still left over from my colony, my country. And that came before the United States to them. But nevertheless, one of the things they did is they began to pass these little rules. You have to be on the side of the North. You have to pray for the Union. You have to pray for the North. And if you didn't, they'd say, we want you to lead in a prayer. And we're going to watch whether or not you'll pray for the North or not. And they begin to pass little rules like that. And all that came true. Churches meeting together have become legislative halls, some said. No one can control a society of men made by men unless they have the iron grip either of an emperor, of a pope, or of a pope. Now, to appoint other bodies than the Lord's church is a complete abandonment of the New Testament pattern. And it's a falling away in some measure from what we started out with, to seek. Pure, undefiled, New Testament Christianity without addition and without subtraction. Tolbert Fanning, I'll mention one or two names, said... All other organizations which men propose to perform spiritual labor tend but to obscure, discredit, and subvert the reign of Christ. I'm going to skip all a bunch, but I want to go down to another. And this one I think is very important. Having been in a lot of preachers' luncheons and having heard others, Johnny Ramsey would stand up and speak to about 30 preachers. We don't have a right to be making those kind of decisions for the elders. Who do we think we are? We're preachers' luncheon. The elders do that kind of thing in the local church. A lot of people didn't like Johnny, you know, but I did. I thought that was right. When you put Christian communities in the power of men, you tend to find them engines to honor men. I don't like that. I hate that. 
Now, let me, and I see a lot of it, and I avoid it. I told Adley, I guess the grandkids have my, my attitude in mind. I said, little Adley, if you go to my funeral and someone just cries, what do you do? He said, well, I just walk up and slap the fire out of them. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm, I'm nothing. I mean, honor me. Good night. How low can we get? He that killeth an ox as he that slew a man. Well, God said, kill these oxen. Offer them and sacrifice to me. But there are some who kill an ox. Well, it's like killing a man. He that sacrifices a lamb is like he that cut off a dog's neck. And he that offereth an oblation as if he offered swine's blood. And he that burneth incense as if he blessed an idol. Let me switch that around a little bit for our day and our thinking. Just to get you to think. He that debates a false teacher is like he that slew a man. We don't need to pound our chest anything we've ever done in this life. Brag about it. If anything, God helped us to get through it alive. And then again, we've done nothing except accept his grace. He that speaks of a lectureship, at a lectureship, like he that cuts off a dog's neck. And he that has perfect attendance is like he that offers swine blood. And he that sits down front with a tie on is just like he that blesses an idol. These external things need to be watched very careful. That's how you can get your glory and you've received your reward, you've been seen of men. And that's what you're doing, a lot of external things for it. It's something to be watched. Other organizations disrobe the church's independency, and they become ecclesiastical tribunals. Well, I wish I had time to go into more of this. I have no power over time, and I wish I could, like Santa Claus, make time travel with me, but it won't during a sermon. I've tried. But Christ, did he ever specify? Let's just notice one, one example. This is under apostolic direction, showing us how Christ works. As a matter of fact, it's under the very words of the Holy Spirit, speaking to a prophet evidently at Antioch right at that moment. What happens? A prophet evidently gets a message, the Holy Spirit saith, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And so the church, the elders, prayed for them, laid hands on them, and sent them away. And yet some people say, well, we can't in our day do that and evangelize the world. We've got to create some kind of institution, some kind of society to do it for us and to govern itself and pay dues so they can get in the leadership and all of that. Well, I notice, though, the Bible doesn't say that. As a matter of fact, uh, we see what the Bible did say. The Holy Spirit said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul. Well, we're separated by reading the Bible, and certain young men want to do it, and they should be taught by older men so that these younger men can teach others also, it says in the Bible. But here's Jesus' attitude. He saw all these people coming to him at Samaria, and they're just, the fields are white with harvest. And the harvest indeed is plenteous. Now, what are we, we're going to have to organize. No, he didn't say that. Or we're going to have to create a society to get this done. No, he didn't say that. The harvest indeed is plenteous. The laborers are few. Ye therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers into his vineyard. Sometimes we forget there's a Lord of harvest. And God, we pray because God hears prayer. And we thank him because he hears our prayers. And pray the Lord of harvest. That's what the Bible says. We want to go with the Bible. There's great power in that. Well, the key to places uh, for foreign missionaries is the Holy Spirit said the local congregation, send them out. Cooperate, yes, we send several and several to the preacher school to learn under other preachers. I wish I had time to talk about preacher schools and what I learned from Eldred Stevens and why they created them. They said, we, if it's bigger than us, we're not going to do it. But we're going to hire older preachers to teach younger men so they can go out and teach others also. There's right now, if I can say this, I ought to have closed about 10 minutes ago, but 
y'all are such a forgiving people. I don't, I'm not afraid of much. Nevertheless, uh, right now, probably, if I can just guess, there's some little jack leg preacher somewhere out there in the United States. And he's thinking, wonder what kind of work I can get together, raise money for, and start and get name recognition. Something bigger than myself. We gotta watch things like that. Anytime you don't do it God's way, there's difficulty. When I was in the mission field, an old missionary stayed with Barbara and I one night. I remember a lot of things they said, and I had to think on them a long time before I could tell if it was right or wrong. I had to read the Bible and all that, but he told me this. I'll tell you why I'm in the mission field. I don't have elders breathing down my neck all the time. That's a real good reason to go to the mission field, isn't it? Get away from elders. I want to get this out from under the elders and out from under the local church. Then I can kind of do what I want to do and I can create something bigger than myself. I like Elder Stevens' attitude. We're not going to have anyone say we're doing something wrong because if we can't do it ourselves as a congregation, we're not going to do it. And then churches can cooperate. We don't deny that. But there's danger everywhere, isn't there? But if you want to become a child of God, would you have the same Bible I have? And if by intense will, desire, and study, we can learn truth. You must believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Uh, Hebrews, or Romans 10, 14. You must repent of your sins, Acts 17, verse 30. And confess your faith, uh, Matthew 10, verse 32. You must make the good confession, as we might say in 1 Timothy 6, 12. And you must uh, not only believe, Acts uh, 2, 38, but be baptized for the remission of your sins. Now, I don't really understand this, but I've read church history a lot. And it seems like even in the Stone-Campbell movement and all, that they finally, Stone said, I read it a long time ago, but it's been brought again to my mind that to be a Christian, to be saved, it takes baptism. For the remission of your sins, half the people left. They left because of water baptism. Would you leave? Or can you obey the gospel? Can we help you? Please come if you wish.